for our podcast. And uh, this is season 31, episode two. Which of 16 types are the most feminine or are feminine, etc.? And uh, this is a very interesting topic because a lot of people have different opinions about what constitutes a feminine type. And oftentimes, it's it's really hard. It's it's really hard to actually like define specifically how that goes, or uh, you know, is it, are we looking at functions? Are we looking at like which aspects of the type grid are we looking at? Like in terms of attributes, expression, worldview, etc. But there has been it's been a subject of huge debate within the community uh, consistently. And it's funny because uh, reading the comments from yesterday's episode, I see that like a few people in the audience maintain that there is just no way the ENTP could be uh, that uh, that feminine. Well, that's the thing because this part, it's kind of up to debate. I can argue that the ENTP is more feminine than the INTP or, you know, Because, again, when it comes to defining what is feminine, what is masculine, it is extremely subjective, extremely subjective. And I have to maintain that overall this is a subjective subject, uh, and I'm using logic uh, as best as possible that I can within the boundaries of a subjective conversation. So that could be a serious problem. And I I get it. I understand that people are going to have struggles with the subjectivity of the subject, but basically I'm doing the best that I can. And there's not really much that can be said for that. Uh, It just is what it is. So I guess how I'm going to present it is here's my thinking. Here's the best to my ability. Here's what I know. And I'll try to outline what parts of this are my opinion and what parts are not. So that being said, I may actually, you know, during this lecture, actually even change my mind and change my position because I keep going back and forth and back and forth. And I don't wanna have confirmation bias within myself because I'm gonna be speaking from my own experience as an ENTP, et cetera. And I'm pretty concerned that is going to cause some issues, potentially. So I'm going to try to be as unbiased as possible, but it's kind of going to be impossible for me to do that anyway. And just kind of go with the flow on this one. So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit. Like, What is the absolute first qualifier for types that are feminine on a type grid? You know, yesterday we talked about, you know, direct types being the first attribute. So logically speaking, that would mean informative types are, first of all, based on their expression, their interaction style slash communication style, because that's the same thing as expression. Just trying to introduce the audience to the new terminology, the new nomenclature uh, that we have on our new uh, test to be on our application. And uh, we're still strategizing with it. And it will be available to everyone very soon. And also, we're going to be adjusting how we're doing coaching in the near future, too. I forgot to mention that. Hashtag announcement real quick. Uh, We're going to be selling sessions by the 15 minutes. Um, We've been able to further systematize what we do and make a more efficient use of time, uh, which is great. Uh, but also the people that do want to get the 30 minute sessions that, that want to get typed to 30 minutes, that's cool because they're also going to get life advice along with that. Typically what we've done is, hey, here's your type. Here's some life advice to go with it. That's usually what the 30 minute sessions are like now anyway, except we're just going to be offering the option for people to do the 15 minute session without the life advice. And it'll be a very nice price adjustment for everybody. That way, uh, it's a lot more accessible to the community. For those of you that want to get coaching with myself or Coach Jay, 
or eventually perhaps uh, Chris Taylor and some of the other people that we have on deck who are training to be CSJ coaches. Just wanted to throw that out there as a reminder that that is coming. But back to the topic. So informative types end up being the most feminine. And the reason why is, is because unlike direct types, they don't choose their role in the conversation. They're not very domineering. They basically provide a lot of information. They also provide context. And they do this in such a way where it gives other people around them the opportunity to direct them, the opportunity to choose their role, uh, choose what they're doing within the conversation, and direct the uh, conversation from there. And this is seen culturally, colloquially, as a very um, feminine thing to do because it comes off more submissive, more deferential, more respectful. And most people that are informed, if you were to ask them like, okay, well, why do you communicate the way that you communicate? Well, I'm just showing respect. That's usually usually the response you'll get from an informative person if you're going to corner them and ask them why they beat around the bush, why they're informative to the people. And it's for that reason. They're just trying to show respect. Whereas direct types, they don't really necessarily care about showing respect. Although oftentimes direct types are like, hey, if you just say it to be straight, that means you're coming off respectful. That means you're being respectful, you know, to me as a result. And okay, cool. That's awesome. But that's not, that's not always true, right? That's not always true. And oftentimes that's just direct types projecting themselves onto other people. And of course that would happen because when you look at STJs being in relationships with STPs, they're basically really direct to each other within the same compatible relationship. That happens all the time, right? Well, the thing is, is that you get into other relationships, like for example, my marriage, my wife, she's triple direct, and I'm pretty informative. Two, two of my main three sides of my mind are informative. So, so, I mean, it makes sense, you know, when you have a triple direct person they come off super masculine. You have a more informative person like myself coming off more feminine. It's just very natural. And that's one of the big stark differences, you know, in terms of informative versus direct, in terms of trying to determine, you know, if you are naturally more feminine than uh, you being masculine. You know, and I can admit it, you know, I'm an ENTP. ENTPs were super feminine. That's just the reality of the situation. We just are. And masculine traits, especially for ENTP men or NTP men or crusader men, basically, masculine traits is basically a learned behavior. It's very much a learned behavior. And a lot of people, a lot of people really struggle with that. So, but in terms of there being like a, a logical, consistent way to look at the type grid and to absolutely determine the masculine or feminine level of like a particular type of the 16 types, well, that can be a problem. That can be, again, it's subjective. It, it's insanely subjective. So I'm gonna state what I maintain are the most feminine, just like I say what I maintain are the most masculine, but it's going to be inconsistent. I'm uh, I'm warning you right now. It's going to be inconsistent. So, because at the end of the day, the subject is really subjective, such that I technically have to provide you with an opinion or an educated guess. So, before you jump on me, please understand that's where I'm coming from with this. You know, in as much as you know. Uh, we could look at the type grid from a systematic standpoint and think the cognitive functions all match out. And, you know, this function represents really masculine. This other function represents really feminine. Put it together. Like, for example, someone yesterday was talking about how an INFP would either be super masculine or an INFP would be 
super feminine, etc. I mean, that's all different. That's a very uh, different approach. And uh, with that being said, like oftentimes most people not really sure. It's still subjective. It's still debatable. But I do know beyond a shadow of a doubt, regardless of what anyone tells me, yes, the ESTP is hands down the most masculine. And society would agree with me. The ESTP is the most masculine. But then again, in terms of the most feminine, I would say hands down, the ISFJ is the most feminine. Hands down, without any debate. Now, for all of you systematic people out there, especially you INTJs watching this right now, why don't you spend some time trying to figure that out and think about or think to yourselves how that is remotely possible? Because you're like, well, hold on. Why isn't it the ISFP or why isn't it, you know, a different a different type? Because I remember someone saying, well, if the ESTP is the most masculine, that must make the ISFP the most feminine, followed by, you know, and I'm just like, guys, were you even paying attention to what I was saying yesterday? That's not how this works. So it's informative types first. And you can kind of look at the ISFJ because if you notice something about the ISFJ when compared to ESTPs, there's something very interesting about it. And I need you folks to stop making this about cognitive functions or trying to create some kind of logical system in terms of individual types or the type grid itself. I need you to keep this in the area of type grid attributes, the attributes of the type grid itself. For example, the most masculine type, the ESTP, is triple direct. Well, guess what? The most feminine type out there is triple informative. That's the ISFJ. So if you're going to start looking for patterns in terms of how to classify these, I suggest you start there. All right. I think that would be far more valuable use of your time instead of trying to use your TI critic forms of logic and come up with the wrong conclusions because you're deciding to take shortcuts and not listen to me. All right, whatever, you know. So that's just really important. It's really important for you to understand those distinctions. But informativeness aside, let's talk about where, you know, experted sensing would be basically the most masculine function. I would have to say that expert intuition is by far the most feminine function. It is the function that sidesteps. It is the one that avoids. It is the one that bows first. It is the one that's constantly trying to be chased instead of doing the chasing because the, NIU, uh, the NISE users are the ones that do the chasing, whereas the NE wants to be sought after. It's also the element that's attached to water, whereas the NI is the element attached to fire. Extra sensing is attached to wind. Those are very masculine forces, but water is a very feminine force. It's very chaotic, and it just has a way of wearing you down, just like a woman has a way of wearing down a man. And remember, we are talking about how um, we are talking about how, you know, in, in the context of, uh, you know, of, of sexuality, because, you know, season 31 is Jungian sexuality. That's what we're calling this season, Jungian sexuality. When you're looking, when you're talking in terms of Jungian sexuality, you have to realize that these functional differences really make up the difference. Yeah, we're looking at communication style first. We're looking at direct versus informative. And that's important, and we're doing it. But what function really helps dominate from there? Now, you could say that, uh, you know, because extroverted sensing on the masculine side is optimistic, well, that's what makes it really, really masculine. And a lot of the INTJs in the audience would assume that that would mean expert intuition also has to be optimistic on the other side. Nope, that's not true. I wager that expert intuition would have to be pessimistic, very pessimistic, to qualify for the most feminine. 
because it's going in that direction. To the point where an expert intuition inferior would technically be the most feminine, right? And then you would have to say that any parent would be after that. And it's at this point where people are like, okay, Mr. C.S. Joseph, I can see what you're saying, claiming that an ISFJ would be the most feminine. But based on what you're saying, that would mean an INTP would be the second most feminine. And to which I would respond, you know what? You're probably right. And I may be inserting my own bias when it comes to considering my own type as a potential type for being the second most feminine. But honestly, after giving it a lot of thought last night, double checking some of my sources and doing some math, I still have to conclude that, okay, yeah, out of the crusader types, you know, the ENTP would definitely probably have to be the fourth most feminine out of them, which is extremely difficult for me to admit. It really is. But I kind of have to. I kind of have to because after looking at, after really considering the strong differences between pessimistic versus optimistic, optimistic energy is more attached to the yang, whereas pessimistic energy is more attached to the yin, and the yin represents the feminine. And that's what we're trying to maximize within this model. We're trying to maximize feminine energy. Feminine energy is what ultimately matters the most within this model. So basically that means I have to issue a retraction from what I said yesterday and state that the INTP is actually the second most feminine of the types, which people are like, whoa, that's a really rough claim. Well, it's possible, especially when they're getting ESFJ focused. They just allow people to kind of plow them consistently and uh, kind of run them over. I mean, it's, it's difficult and it sucks. And a lot of people just, I mean, they have a really hard time enforcing their boundaries. And the reason why is because if you actually look at it on the flip side through cognitive access, if you see their SI hero of the ISFJ and the introverted sensing of the, um, of the uh, introverted sensing child, the INTP, what you end up coming to realize is that while most people would expect that because they have the highest endurance out of the top, out of the out of the crusaders because they're optimistic with their endurance, that would mean that they would enforce boundaries more often, right? Well, the answer to that is actually no. They would not. They would not do that. Reason why is it's because introverted sensing hero and introverted sensing child has such amazing ability to endure that they often first choose to endure as a higher priority when compared to um, uh, when compared to um, establishing and enforcing boundaries. And establishing and enforcing boundaries is an introverted sensing pessimistic trait, which would technically mean it's more masculine because establishing boundaries and then enforcing your boundaries is technically a masculine behavior. But it's more prevalent in the introverted sensing pessimistic types than it is the introverted sensing optimistic types. So the introverted sensing optimistic end up being more feminine and the expert intuition pessimistic types end up being more feminine, where it's the opposite for the other ones. So use that as your logic, I guess, when determining which types are the most feminine. And naturally speaking, since the ISFJ with pessimistic expert intuition and being triple informative and being behind the scenes with their interaction style, Def, uh, definitely, uh, or, you know, their expression style, et cetera, communication style, whatever style we're talking about, they're all the same anyway. Based on these styles, you know, that would basically mean that ESFJ is the third most feminine. And then with the INTP being the second most uh, feminine, that is a huge, 
huge spider walking on the ground there. Holy smokes. I'm going to give that one a wide berth. Dang. So based on that, you know, the, the INTP second most, that would mean the ENTP is the fourth most feminine. So so where I got to eat crow and put my foot in my mouth because I spoke too soon. And but luckily for the sake of this uh, lecture or this episode, I decided to verify and make sure just in case, which is really important if you think about it. Really, really important. All right. So I'm glad the that some people in the audience decided to challenge me when I was reading through the comments uh, last night. And that continued to be a problem for me. And then as a result of making that decision, which I did, I I did make that decision uh, and did a little bit more research, I've been able to come up with a much better conclusion for you all. So I hope that works out for you in your favor. So yeah, Uh, let's, let's keep that under you know some kind of understanding moving forward i do read your guys comments i do care about your comments i'm not always right and i'm willing to admit it unlike other people out there who just assume i'm just some arrogant asshole but i sound arrogant because you know i'm a tp T- all tps sound arrogant because tps have this problem where their thinking is what actually changes uh and, or dictates social norms Whereas the FJs of the world think that social norms are what dictate thinking. And I don't subscribe to that. This is why FJs are at the risk of being sheep in their life and allowing society or social norms to dictate their own thinking, which I completely disagree with and I think is inappropriate. So, so yeah. Um, So that being said, Please continue to keep an open mind about this topic with, how, with the subjectivity in it, because we haven't exactly entirely defined masculinity yet or femininity, and then how they evolve over time in a person's life. And episode three is going to actually be discussing that a little bit more, because I can't get into the nitty gritty details about sexuality until we actually come to a fundamental understanding as to how these two gender roles actually evolve over time and you know what is the role of a male versus a female child and then young adult adults etc parents what their roles are and we're just going to be defining those gender roles in terms of what they should be from a Jungian psychology point of view as well as a biological point of view and without doing that oh mosquitoes decide to come out Because as a result of doing that, we'll be able to come to that better fundamental understanding, have that foundation poured, and then move forward with the rest of the content for season 31. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things in season 31 that's a little well, it's out there. uh, Most people are going to disagree with it, but it is what it is. I'm just here to tell you the truth. So, ISFJs. Being the most feminine, let's talk more a little bit about extra intuition and fear. So they have actual fear of being unwanted. And because of this, this causes them to serve. And most people maintain that the feminine is often at the service of the masculine on a day-to-day basis, even though the masculine is often expected to lay down its life for the feminine in many cases. And throughout a lot of stories, hero's journey, etc. But the thing is, though, is that expert intuition is all about what other people want. And what this does, it causes introverted sensing to become loyal, loyal to other people. And through that loyalty, this causes SI users, especially, especially SI optimistic types like SI heroes and SI child types more than anybody to orbit around other people. This causes them to orbit uh, around other people. And this could be a serious problem. This could be, uh, well, it's a really big problem if you're a man and you're orbiting other people because you start out young in your life and as an SI user, you find yourself already orbiting other people, which means you're already being loyal to other people, which means 
you're giving your time and attention to other people instead of putting on yourself. And this causes you to have a very tribe over self point of view, as Dave Superpowers would say with objective personality system. That's what causes an SI user to have that point of view. But the fact that they are loyal to somebody else and not necessarily to themselves, because an SE user only has so much loyalty to go around. So they spend all their attention, they spend all their loyalty on themselves. So that way they orbit themselves. They do not orbit other people. And because of that, they end up getting the title of being more masculine and the SI users get the title of being more feminine naturally, okay? So that could be an issue. That could definitely be an issue, especially for crusader men, especially for men like me who I've been demonized and derided my whole life, you know, for, for being too masculine or, or not too masculine, for being too feminine. I always remember my family giving me so much crap about, you know, coming off like some kind of boy or, or I mean, like a girl or screaming like a girl or being getting excited like a girl, or just acting or behaving like a girl at all times. And I got shot on consistently by my family, especially my male cousins who are all STPs, basically, just absolutely crushing me in that direction. And that was difficult. It was really, really hard. This is why, you know, when you have male space, male space is extremely important for boys because the boys that naturally have masculinity through their cognition are there to basically shit on all of the boys who don't to make them stronger. This is why you see ESTP bullies beating the weaker SI user kids like this ESTP I knew who would beat up his ISTJ brother all the time saying, I just had to make him stronger so he wouldn't be weak in school and get beaten up by other kids. So if I beat him up first, then he's going to be stronger later. Now, I'm not saying this is okay. I'm not condoning this behavior. That's actually ignorant and comes from a lack of understanding. But this is what male space is generally for. Male space exists for the yang energy to come out through the experted sensors within male space to cause the SI user men to rise to the occasion and become stronger themselves so that those SI user men end up getting to the point where they actually can put themselves above tribe, make themselves more selfish and responsibly selfish so that they are putting themselves above other people. Because that's what that's how that's that's an aspect of masculine behavior. You have to, as a man, walk around in life and just be like, I am more important than other people and treat yourself that way. But SI user men, especially crusader men, because you're mixing SI with FE at the same time, or quite frankly, actually NE, which is the most feminine cognitive function. And you're mixing it with FE, which is all about other people's feelings and what other people value. When you're mixing NE with FE, you have this super feminine man. And yet what's really interesting about that, the most attractive women out there, the women who have the most humility, the women who do their duty, the women who are strong and steadfast, the women who are super mega loyal, who all want to be wanted, they all want to be sought after, they are the most feminine women. They're also the most prized women out there. And that's why, technically speaking, the ISFJ women, the ISFJ woman itself as an archetype, quite frankly, is the most valuable woman out there in the eyes of men in general. So isn't it so interesting that ISFJ women is the most common type of woman? They're also the most common type of mother. ISFJ women are more likely to be mothers than any of the other 16 types because they are the most feminine and they are the most sought after by men as we know it. And it's, it's obvious. They are the most feminine and men want femininity from a woman. It's really important. I talk about this a little bit in season four where I talk about how humility is the source of beauty. But it's actually really, really easy with how self-deprecating an ISFJ woman is 
for her to quickly arrive to a state of humility mentally, which increases her beauty and thusly would make her more beautiful than other women in the eyes of men in general, which is why she would end up being the hottest commodity in the sexual marketplace. She is, by definition, wife material. <laughs> then you look at an ISSJ man by, uh, you know, by definition, well, he ain't fuckable. He ain't masculine. He ain't getting laid. Not really. Because he's the most feminine man in this culture. And this constitutes a big problem, a huge problem. And this is a problem we're going to be talking about a lot in the next episode. So we're going to be defining specifically what masculinity is and what femininity is. And then what are those traits that people need to have uh, to as learned behavior? We're going to be talking about... Uh, we're talking about the traits that they have uh, as natural behavior. What does that look like? And then what do feminine men do, right? What do masculine women do to solve the problems? Because based on my own experience, and I am very biased when I say this, but also the experience of the people that I've coached within my coaching practice, which is now thousands of people, I could say. I've helped thousands plural, of people uh, in my life with, uh, uh, with my coaching practice, that these people are the most unhappy in Western society. And quite frankly, these people are fast becoming the most unhappy in any society. And it's because there just is not a support structure for these people to be able to get the learned behavior that they need in order to explore their masculine traits. If they are feminine men or their feminine traits if they are feminine women. It's a serious problem, huge problem, one that is threatening the very foundation of society itself, because I maintain that this society is about to end and end suddenly with a decree of utter destruction. We don't start changing these things now. I maintain that it's important for everyone to be embracing Jungian sexuality as soon as possible and manage their sexuality in that way so that they can actually be happy and then have great healthy relationships, especially sexual relationships, produce stronger and more capable children as a result, and also stick around for the parenting and also have the support structure necessary for parenting. You know, a lot of people think the nuclear family is such a great thing when it comes to parenting. I disagree. I don't think it is. And I'll be explaining more about that in, in uh, season here in season 31 so that we can have that discussion. Because it's definitely a... Uh, well, it's definitely a problem. No matter how... Uh, how you look at it so extroverted intuition like i said it's like water it represents the yin it's it's pliable it's not firm like the yang the firmness you know being domineering expert sensing that firmness with that fiery passion from ni it's just not there willpower willpower is the source of the soul. It's the source of energy. It's the source of heat. It's the source of fire. But the cold, deep abyss of expert intuition, that is the feminine. And going all the way back to Plato as a philosopher, when you read the allegory of the cave, you will come to realize this. You will come to know this. The allegory of the cave is very serious uh, representation of the feminine versus the masculine because the cave itself is dark it's wet it's basically a vagina or a womb if you think about it and it's safe but everyone's got to come out of the cave sometime everyone's got to be in the sunlight everyone's got to feel the heat right and that's the heat and I is the heat well 
where is there heat right now? Well, that's the sun. There's the heat from the sun, right? It provides light, and light is what allows things to grow. Because without light, there's no growth. There's not at all. But you also need water. So you need a mixture of light and water to be able to produce life. So photosynthesis with plants. They need energy from the sun because they turn uh, they turn sunlight into energy, but they also need water to grow as well. So they need the support of the feminine as well. And this is how it works. And this is how the universe is structured through this yin and yang equilibrium. And that's why expert intuition is attached to the feminine side. And that's why expert intuition pessimistic is attached to the most feminine from a cognitive function standpoint. And extra sensing optimistic is what is attached to the most uh, masculine, basically, uh, for the 16 types in terms of cognitive functions. But all of that to say, interaction style or communication style or expression style, a person's expression still is, you know, it holds higher value because you end up having to look at all four sides of the mind. That's why we start with the most triple direct type, the ESTP, it's the highest masculinity. And then you have the lowest masculinity being the INSFJ because it's triple informative, but it's also the highest femininity. So understand these concepts. You know, like otherwise, you know, people out there, like I said in episode one, they're just going to get too judgmental. You guys are going to get way too judgmental about it. And I don't want you folks to get judgmental of people. You got to give, you know, those feminine men the opportunity to be those late bloomers, basically. Same thing with the masculine women and stop being so prejudiced against them. You know, it's, psychological racism and psychological prejudice is actually a really big deal. And a lot of people aren't even aware of how much of a problem it is. It's a huge problem. It's a big problem. And if you're not going out of your way to hedge yourself against this, well, then you're going to be insanely judgmental and you're going to end up alienating a lot of people. Believe me, I have. And in some cases, I still do, oftentimes. But just realize, like, especially if you're parenting children, you know, and you're a father and you're unhappy with how feminine your son is. Well, guess what? You need to get to a point to understand him and put him into a process or a ritual so that he can transform from a boy into a man. And we're going to be discussing that a lot in episode three. I might do episode three tomorrow. Who knows? We'll see. We've been doing these episodes kind of at random. I'm not going to be posting when I'm doing these streams. You guys are just going to have to be on the alert. Make sure you click the notification button below so you know when I go live so you can uh, not miss this, etc. And I may even take these episodes down in the future. So... We'll see. I might make them members only. May not. Not really sure about what I'm going to do there. So it just depends on how many likes I get on the videos, I guess. So help me get to 100,000 subscribers, guys. Like, hit the subscribe button. Majority of the people that watch this channel don't even subscribe. Well, I suggest you do. Help me get to 100,000. We already got to 50,000. Let's get on going to 100,000. That'll be pretty awesome if I do say so myself. Be nice to have the support of the community behind me while I do it. So, anyway, folks, that's it for season 31, episode two, which the 16 types are feminine. And uh, if you like what you saw, leave a like button. Please subscribe and leave a comment below. I read all the comments, etc. And uh, that ends uh, this episode. So, with all that, see, uh, with all that being said, guys, I'll see you.